The amphibious landing by three commando brigade at San Carlos in the early hours of Friday, the 21st of May, marked the beginning of what was probably the most complex and dangerous operation undertaken by British troops since Suez. And whereas at Suez, all commanders down to company level had war experience behind them, in the Falklands, neither Brigadier Thompson, Commodore Clapp, nor any of their subordinate commanders and staffs had any similar experience upon which to base their planning. The landing itself had been accomplished virtually without loss, behind a smokescreen of diversionary raids and bombardments. There was no significant contact with ground troops, and the Argentine response, when it came, two hours after dawn on the 21st, came from the air, and was directed principally at the naval escort ships. attacks, HMS Ardent, a Type 21 frigate on the gun line, providing naval gunfire support for the SAS diversionary attack on Darwin, succumbed to repeated Argentine bombing runs and sank. Four other ships suffered serious damage. Sixteen enemy aircraft were shot down. The Argentine Air Force had shown itself to be highly motivated and effective, but it had taken losses which could not be sustained for long, and by nightfall, with the beachhead firmly secured, our losses of men and ships were considerably lighter than might have been expected. The choice of San Carlos as the site for the landings had been thoroughly vindicated, but this did not alter the fact that the arguments in favour of San Carlos were overwhelmingly naval ones. A deep water anchorage, sheltered from the worst of the roaring 40s winter storms, its narrow entrance securing it from submarine attack, surrounded by high ground, providing natural protection from enemy aircraft and missiles. The penalty, from the point of view of 3 Commander Brigade, was the 50 miles of rough and boggy terrain that separated it from its ultimate objective, the liberation of Port Stanley. Port Stanley would be the key to victory. Regardless of the number of soldiers deployed elsewhere on the islands, he who held Port Stanley held the Falklands, certainly in the eyes of the world, which, through extensive press and television coverage, followed both sides every move. But we will reach peace and honourable and just peace through negotiations. Since the vast majority of the Argentine forces were grouped in and around Stanley, it was there that the decisive battle would be fought. Getting the men, their weapons and equipment from San Carlos to Port Stanley was to pose a logistic nightmare. Indeed, logistics were already a very real problem to Brigadier Thompson. Plans made prior to the landing assumed that with the air battle won and air superiority assured, logistics would, for the most part, remain afloat with resupply direct from supply ship to unit. The fact that this plan now had to be changed can be traced back to the 4th of May and the sinking by air-launched Exocet of the destroyer HMS Sheffield. The threat of further Exocet attacks obliged Admiral Woodward to keep his carrier battle group outside the combined range of the Super Etendar, based on the Argentine mainland, and its Exocet missile. As a result, the landings were undertaken without a decisive air battle having been fought, and San Carlos water, far from being the safe anchorage it was intended to be, became instead Bomb Alley. The Commodore Amphibious Warfare, therefore, had no choice but to insist that logistic ships and their escorts be withdrawn by day, coming into offload only under cover of darkness. In a bit of a rush, we offloaded ships uh, against the plan in order to get them clear and caused the logistic organisation one or two headaches because it became impossible to find the equipment that they particularly asked for uh, without devilling down into a monumental pile of kit and bringing out a whole lot more. The air attacks brought upon us by the Argentinian Air Force, with the ships therefore going out to sea during the day, meant that our plan to have a float resupply had to be scotched. We therefore decided to set up a force maintenance area at Ajax Bay, bringing all our stocks ashore as quickly as possible. Now, of course, we also intended 
to resupply the units as they moved forward across the island by helicopter. But the sinking of Atlantic Conveyor took away three of the four Chinook helicopters that we were planning to use. And so the force maintenance area established in Ajax Bay with none of the requirements laid down in all our textbooks for such a logistic installation became rather like a large goods yard. It was muddy, it was disorganized, it had no hard standing, no cover. But my goodness me, the flexibility of the men there and their hard work both day and night meant that we were able to sort it out. Serious though the losses of shipping were in the days immediately following the landing, HMS Antelope on D plus two, Atlantic Conveyor, and HMS Coventry on D plus four. By D plus five, the Sea Harriers in particular, along with other air defense weapon systems, had imposed so heavy a rate of attrition on the Argentine Air Force that the air battle was largely won, and the threat posed by their aircraft was greatly reduced, but by no means completely eliminated. At his Northwood headquarters, the Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Fieldhouse, now advised by his new land deputy, Lieutenant General Sir Richard Trent, sought some urgent indication of the pattern the land campaign would take. With the San Carlos beachhead secure, the vital question was, when and how would land forces break out from that beachhead and close up towards Port Stanley? The Commander Land Forces, General Moore, en route from Ascension in the QE2 with 5 Infantry Brigade, was virtually incommunicado and unable to play any part in planning the breakout. So it was to Brigadier Thompson and his hard-pressed staff that Admiral Fieldhouse now turned for a plan for the next phase of land operations. By D plus one, it was quite clear that we were well secure and established ashore and able to beat off any sort of counterattack that the enemy might mount, and that we must now get on with the business of getting to Port Stanley, which clearly was the objective. And we'd already started preliminary moves in that direction by putting out reconnaissance the night before as light was fading, that was the last helicopter task. And I discussed with Mike Rose the business of putting D Squadron forward onto Mount Kent, which was clearly with Mount Challenger the vital ground and the top of the staircase, as I've heard it described, leading to Port Stanley. By the 27th of May, it had been possible to get in the SAS squadron into this region without any loss of life. The Argentine forces had detected our presence on the Mount Kent and had made one or two attempts to identify our strengths up there and also remove us from that position because it gave us the ability to overlook the, all their defensive positions around Port Stanley. But the most memorable attempt the Argentines made came when they inserted a 12-man special force patrol late one night into this area. Unfortunately for them, they chose a position for their dropping off point, which was midway between three of our troop locations. And the rest of that night was spent bouncing this special force patrol between the three troop positions. And by dawn, there were only three survivors of this particular Argentine patrol. What I had in mind was that D Squadron would be followed up by a heli lift forward of at least two or three of my commanders or battalions onto that vital ground. At that stage, I was batting on the directive that I'd been given, which we'd received on the 12th of May, which to paraphrase said, secure a beachhead into which you can land, into which an airstrip can be built, from which you are then to mount operations to dominate the enemy and to uh, fight for or seek information and intelligence, into which I will land five brigade and then mount operations to repossess the Falkland Islands. So going along with that directive, I'd already started doing work on recce, as, I, as I've just described, it seemed that the nearest enemy that were handy were the traps down in Darwin and Goose Green and that a raid in that direction was in order. For various reasons, that raid was cancelled by me and it seemed to me that was a diversion from the aim of getting onto Stanley and therefore we weren't going to mount it again. I then decided that the helicopter lift should go ahead, but just as we were putting final touches to the helicopter lift, 
uh, a man walked in and said, Atlantic and Ver has been sunk, taking to the bottom the heavy lift helicopters except for one. At about this time also, pressure was being put on me to get moving, which was, as far as I was concerned, slightly unwelcome pressure, but that's the facts of life, orders is orders, and you just have to get on with it. And the phraseology being used was, invest Stanley. Well, clearly, we had to get on with it. And the only way we were going to get on with it without helicopters was by walking a large proportion of the brigade. What we decided to do was that two para would go down and capture Darwin and Goose Green, that 40 commando would remain behind to protect the beachhead and logistic area, and that 45 commando and three para would walk to the high ground by way of Douglas settlement as far as 4-5 Commando is concerned, and by way of Teal Inlet as far as 3 Para were concerned, mm -hmm. and the 42 Commando, the only part remaining of the original plan, would follow up D Squadron 22 SAS to Mount Kent. Dawn, D plus 6, the 27th of May. For 3 Para and 4-5 Commando, the 50 miles to the high ground overlooking Stanley was to be covered on foot. Three para making the tab direct to Teal Inlet and from there to Mount Estancia. Four five commando yomping to Douglas Settlement before following three para through Teal to strike southeast to Mount Kent. Sergeant Duggan of three para recalls the start of the tab. The initial breakout from Port San Carlos wasn't on foot, it was by boat. These little rigid raider things, it's like a dustbin lid with a, an engine on the back and you scoot across the water. And we went for about well, three and a half miles on one of those, which is a godsend, really. And uh, once we got out of those, we set off with whatever kit we carried, which was light assault order, which turns out with all your ammunition and stuff, it's, it's weighing a considerable amount. In some cases, people were carrying uh, 80 pounds, 90 pounds, 100 pounds, wasn't uncommon for light assault order. And once you got a couple of Ks into the tub, you realise that the ground it's just like a big sponge with um, thistles on it. So every time you put your foot down, your feet were wet. Your feet would slide around in the boots, taking the skin straight off, which certainly let you know that you were walking after a while, particularly with the weight on the back. And the climatic conditions to start off with, the, the weather was a nice crisp day. It was uh, full of sunshine, but within minutes it would turn into a, a blizzard and then it'd go back to sunshine again. And then you'd have... Uh, the rain belting you straight in the face, and it'd be a good one, one that made your eyes shut. The march across to Teal took us um, two nights, uh, with a day in the middle of those two nights, some of which were spent in lying up. And the terrain we crossed was extremely difficult, particularly by night. And therefore, there's no doubt that by the time we arrived at Teal, which we found um, unoccupied by the enemy, um, we were all very tired, and the weather was filthy. It was like an Arctic blizzard for about five hours, which was probably the coldest one I'd ever experienced. And digging, we were told to dig down into uh, first position trenches. And the ground was such that you dug about three spades full, and you were down to about two feet of water. So that sort of knocked it on the head, and you started to build up, up above the ground then. And then the next thing was trying to keep the guys uh, motivated because the tendency was with, with these high winds blowing in and the snow coming down that they would just sit down in a, in a huddle. So the idea was to keep them rotating through uh, sentry positions or minor jobs, wherever you could do, just to keep them working, just to keep them on the toes. The heavy equipment, and by that I mean everything from Milan missiles to mortars uh, to our Bergens, uh, that heavy equipment was brought up to us at Teal by a combination of the one Chinook, which was now available and did sterling work for us in bringing up mostly our Bergens, and the two tractors and trailers that had been requisitioned from Port San Carlos and which followed us up with uh, mortar ammunition and Milan ammunition. We uh, set off onto another leg of the march, which would take us eventually to Estancia House uh, and Estancia Mountain. The tub across there was some pretty rugged ground, most of it being uphill. We never ever seemed to be going downhill. The wind uh, blew quite a gale, and just on the forward estuary of uh, Mount Estancia, 
we were right next to the, the open sea and we got told to go firm about one o'clock in the morning. And again, the buzz went round that it's possible air attack may be used against us. So we all went into two man positions, ready to uh, repel any airborne invaders. And uh, we just laid there for 12 hours and it was cold. The wind blew and the sea was crashing against us. And it was very cold and that made you think, when's this gonna end? You know, uh, how old will I be when it stops? The 4-3 Para and 4-5 Commander set out from San Carlos at first light on the 27th of May. Two Para had moved south the previous night from their positions on Sussex Mountains for a battalion attack on the Argentine positions around the populated settlements of Darwin and Goose Green. We had come about 8,000 miles to do battle with the enemy. And after a week we had spent on top of Sussex Mountains, we were slowly deteriorating because of the cold, because of the weather, and we'd also watched the Argentinian aircraft sinking the shipping in San Carlos water. H particularly was very anxious to get moving, to get to grips with the Argentinian army. The release of the civilians was of paramount importance in the planning of the battle for Goose Green. We had, after all, come a long way to release these people, and the last thing we wanted was to destroy them in achieving our mission. And so H constructed a plan that would free these people once we had destroyed the enemy on the field of battle. Lieutenant Colonel H. Jones gave his company commanders their detailed orders at Camilla Creek House as darkness fell on the night of 27th of May. His plan called for a night attack, the fighting to be pressed home in daylight in order to minimize the risk to the civilian population. At 02.35 hours on the 28th of May, a Company crossed their start line and made rapid progress to their first objective, Burntside House, which was taken after a brief firefight against an enemy force of about platoon strength. B Company crossed their start line at 03.15 hours, 45 minutes after A Company. Almost at once, they encountered what was to be the first of many Argentine positions sighted in depth down the isthmus. They too, however, were able to make good progress southwards. D Company, following on the central axis, quickly encountered further enemy positions which had been bypassed in the dark by the other two companies. We were moving up onto a suspected enemy Argentinian position. Tempertoon was on my right. As we were moving up, suddenly Green Tracer came from a machine gun position on the top of the hill and it sprayed over the top of Tempertoon. At that instant, the command net went chaotic. Everyone was trying to give a contact report. Everyone was dashing down, taking cover. I dashed into a hole and looked around and could see all the boys' faces looking towards me, looking for some word of command, something to do. I contacted the Tempertoon commander and said, do you need fire support from me? Which he said yes, so I, I moved a section up onto a little rise that was just in front of me and got the rest of the platoon into a little gully. As the section got onto the top of this rise, they in fact encountered another enemy position which hadn't been located. As they came on the top of the rise, the gunner and the two, two IC of the section, that's Corporal Bingley, saw this position and tried charging straight in. The enemy opened up and Corporal Bingley was shot and died instantly. The machine gunner was shot in the hip and dropped the gun. And at the same time, another member of the section was shot in the stomach by a ricochet. Gave me three casualties within the first two minutes of the battle. Fortunately, my platoon sergeant got in there straight away and started dragging the casualties back. Meanwhile, the section commander, Corporal Harley, finished off the Argentinian position uh, with a white phosphorus grenade. As soon as we cleared the position, we all reorganised and breathed a big sigh of relief. We'd realised we'd been under sniper fire and machine gun fire for about five to ten minutes, and nobody had really noticed it. We'd all been so intense in getting our casualties back and getting on and getting through this position. Meanwhile, A Company reached the area of Coronation Point, unopposed, by 0530 hours. Having been surprised to find no enemy on Coronation Point, I placed Guy Wallace's platoon to cover uh, across the water to the Darwin settlement where we believed there would be a machine gun and a mortar position. Then with light fast coming up, I hastened with the rest of the company over towards the Gorse Gully, which we've been led to believe would give us the heights of Darwin to look down into the settlement. Two platoon led, my command group followed behind them, then one platoon, and then my second in command's group behind them. I suppose we were halfway across and suddenly from the large re-entrant which ran into the central track going down the isthmus, 
a huge weight of fire opened up upon us. Quickly, people doubled forward into the gully, and from there, a rather grim fight began to take the hill. By first light, the battalion had reached the core of the Argentine defences, a series of strong positions stretching from Darwin Hill in the east to Boca House in the west. With mortar ammunition already running low, and HMS Arrow unable to contribute fire support because of problems with her gun, it was left to the crews of the three 105mm guns to provide fire support at a time when strong, gusting crosswinds were making their task particularly difficult. Meanwhile, fog that was covering the carrier battle group way out to the east prevented harriers from providing close air support. Two para were very much on their own. Up to this point, their casualties had been light. Now it seemed the tide of fortune might be turning against them. B Company had got to within a thousand metres of their objective, the Bocker House ruin, when they came under sniper and heavy machine gun fire from a strong enemy position to the south. Short of ammunition and too far from the enemy to return effective fire, they remained pinned down under mortar and artillery bombardment for the next two hours, while A Company faced equally determined resistance from the enemy positions on their objective, Darwin Hill. Being surprised by the direction and weight of the enemy fire, there was, for a period of time, some confusion. Initially, members of 2 Platoon and Captain Watson, my FOO, got involved in a brave little action to clear the immediate trenches on the edge of the gully. In the meantime, a number of men, caught out in the open, gradually began to winkle their way up into the gully. It quickly became clear that there were a number of enemy trenches close to us, perhaps within 200 metres. I then began to attempt, by pushing two platoons through the top of the gully, a flanking attack. This failed because when the leading element of two platoon got onto the top, they were pinned down and forced back by some very heavy machine gun and sniper fire from much more distant trenches than we'd realised were there at the time. By now the light was up, and whilst the group machine guns were dealing with the furthest trenches, groups of two and three soldiers were attempting to force their way forward to the nearest trenches, perhaps 100 metres away. After about an hour and a half, Colonel Jones came up to join me. By now the ammunition was beginning to worry me as a factor. We'd used a great deal of mortar ammunition and had called for a Harrier strike, which had been uh, cancelled because of the fog at sea. Shortly afterwards, realising the urgency to keep moving, Colonel Jones urged me to take the ledge just above us, above the gully. Gathering together a dozen or so men, we charged up the ledge. The enemy positions, perhaps 90 or 100 metres away, began to fire indiscriminately at our group. Three men were killed instantly, my second in command over to the left and Corporal Hardman just forward. Realising that the weight of fire was too great, we began slowly to winkle down on our stomachs, back to a position of some safety. It was then that I realised that Colonel Jones and his party had seized that moment to go round the corner into the next little re-entrant to try and unsettle the enemy. That was the I Series Protection Party, and we just joined A Company and moved off the top of the feature in attacking the final part of the Argentinian position. The smoke suddenly cleared and we were under heavy fire, so we took cover. The colonel immediately jumped up and moved off to the right, shouting, follow me. I followed him and a few people followed on behind me. We got round to a gully. Just as I entered the gully, the colonel was about 25 metres in front. Somebody to our rear shouted out, watch out, there's an enemy trench to the left. Up until this time, we hadn't seen it. I hit the ground and returned fire just as the Argentinian position opened fire on us. I looked up and the colonel was in dead ground between two Argentinian trenches. He looked up at this new position, checked his magazine on his SMG and went charging up the hill. As he got to within a few feet of the position, I noticed fire coming from his rear. I told him to watch his fucking back, which he totally ignored. He continued up the hill and I noticed the fire coming closer to him and he was actually shot in the back and he fell in a matter of a couple of feet from the position he was about to attack. Shortly afterwards, I heard on the radio that the colonel was hit. Having come down from the ledge, which he'd asked us to take, we moved a group round to be close to Sergeant Barrett, who was still manning the machine guns. From that point, Corporal Abels was able to put a 66mm into one of the nearest trenches, there being only five or six left of the 22 originally fighting against us, who were still operating. At that stage, white flags began to appear. I urged caution on the company, lest 
Only the nearest trenches may be surrendering and fire could still come from the others. We eventually urged them not only to lift their white flags, but to come out. At that point, we took the surrender and began to deal with the wounded. The battle for Darwin Hill had, in a few short minutes, cost the lives of the CO, Colonel Jones, his adjutant, Captain David Wood, the second in command of A Company, Captain Chris Dent, and nine other men. But the sheer determination and fighting qualities of the company, coupled with the devastating display of courage by its colonel, who was later posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, had undermined the Argentine will to resist, and shortly afterwards, Darwin Hill was in A Company's hands. Thus it was to B Company's battle at Bocker House that Major Chris Keeble, formerly second in command but now commanding 2 para, had to turn his attention with some urgency. With the brigade liaison officer, Hector Gullen, and my signallers and my defence, we moved towards the right flank, carrying as much mixed link ammunition as we could for the GPMG machine guns, and headed off towards Bocker House. When I arrived there, there was some confusion. B Company was caught on the forward slope. D Company had arrived and was to the rear of the hill, waiting for orders. The Milan platoon had arrived with the machine guns from the support company, and there was a general air of confusion. And I decided that we would launch a concentrated attack on the defensive positions around Bocca House. And that meant lining up the machine guns and the Milan on the ridge line behind B Company, slipping D Company down onto the beach to go right down the left flank of the enemy position, bring in the artillery, coordinate the mortar fire, and then unleash this particular attack, which we did successfully with the support of B Company, and the enemy collapsed. Throughout that afternoon, we had fought to close up on the settlement of Goose Green, We'd captured the airfield, and by late afternoon, we had surrounded the settlement. But we were tired. We'd been fighting for about 40 hours. We were very short of ammunition. We were under artillery fire. We were also under direct fire from the 35 millimeter anti-aircraft guns in the settlement. What we couldn't do was break the will of the enemy's defense. And there's only one way we could do that, and that was to get the close air support. We had been trying all afternoon to get Harriers to help us out in this particular situation. I was on standby on Hermes that evening with Flight Lieutenant Tony Harper as number two. We'd been at cockpit uh, readiness, and because the weather on the ship was particularly bad, the captain had just stood us down to crew room readiness, which was 20 minutes. Uh, we'd been in the crew room for about 10 minutes or so, when an immediate task came in for a close air support mission in support of two para. We were given a target position, which gave us 30 seconds on the floor of the ship to quickly plot the target position and draw a line uh, that we planned to approach the target on. And in doing so, we also picked up a number three, squadron leader Jerry Pook. We rushed back up to the aeroplanes uh, on the top. Two of us had cluster bombs and Jerry Pook had rockets in his aeroplane. We launched off Hermes, climbed up to medium altitude, uh, which was necessary because of the distance of the ship from the islands. When we got to overhead the goose green area, uh, we could see the ground, so we realized that descending down wasn't going to be a problem through cloud. So we held up at 25,000 feet uh, to get the briefing from the forward air controller. He gave us the same target position as we'd had on the ground, which was unusual in itself. And we then let down to low level for the run-in. Goose Green wasn't a popular area from our point of view. When we'd been there in the past, we'd always been met by a heavy barrage of AAA. We realised their morale was probably up because they'd shot a Sea Harrier down early in the conflict and a couple of days before this, they'd shot down a GR3. The target position was on the little land jutting out to the east of Goose Green settlement and it was a very unique uh, position, easy to, to acquire. So therefore target acquisition wasn't a problem. We dropped down to very low level and ran in 50 feet or possibly a wee bit lower. As we came into sight of Goose Green, uh, there was smoke everywhere and it looked, as you would imagine, classically a battlefield to look. We could see to the left a building on fire, which I suspect was the schoolhouse at Darwin, uh, and there was smoke and stuff all over the place. Two of us, one and two, ran in about line astern to drop our cluster bombs on that point. I put mine down on the easternmost point of the land uh, just as I dropped the bombs, I saw some activity to my right-hand side. I called it to Tony, 
He just had time to align his attack to put his bombs down to the right of where mine had been. Uh, Jerry Pook ran in from the left-hand side, about parallel to the coast, attacking from north to south. And he fired his rockets into the same area as we put our cluster bombs down. And we all then exited the area at high speed, ultra low level to the southeast. Now, well remember, at uh, 1925 hours, to my great delight, two Harriers came in from the west over the airfield where we had removed the air defense weapons and in para terms wellied the enemy with their CBUs and the effect was absolutely devastating. And in my view, it was at that point that the enemy and its commanders realized they were finished. At last light, I returned to the main headquarters and tried to work out what the hell do I do now? We still hadn't achieved the mission of capturing Darwin and Goose Green. We had casualties on the battlefield, we had prisoners of war. We were very low in ammunition. And it seemed to me the simplest solution was to resupply and then in the morning undertake a siege where we would bombard the settlement and then feed in company after company to remove the enemy. Well, after we'd sent a patrol down to Darwin, we discovered that there were 112 civilians locked up in the community hall in the very centre of the settlement. So my clever siege plan was useless. I would have to remove the civilians before I undertook that kind of operation. And that meant I would have to speak to the Argentinians. And so this idea grew in my mind that perhaps we could speak to them and negotiate a surrender as a preliminary, which we planned to do over that night. And I spoke to the brigadier and arranged for us to be resupplied with guns and ammunition and mortars. And I spoke to two Argentinian prisoners of war and I explained to them how bad the situation was for them and that they were required at dawn to go down under a white flag with a piece of paper which would give an ultimatum to the commander at Goose Green. Surrender or take the consequence. Either case, release the civilians. The enemy agreed to surrender. In a bold stroke, two para had taken Goose Green along with over 900 Argentine prisoners. They liberated 112 civilians, shocked, but otherwise unharmed. <laughs> First Harrier attack, I think it was on the 2nd of May. Um, they seemed to sort of get very scared. They came into the settlement and took us from all our houses, and they sort of herded us over to the social club, the recreation hall. I never want to live through that again. What was the worst time? In the hall when we was underneath the floor, when the, when they, uh, Harry's came over, you know, to get the big guns down the point. I thought we'd had it, you know. <laughs> My first impression was leave, go, you know. But when you've realised what they've done from Britain to help us, no way would I shift now. This is my country and I'm staying here. <laughs> I couldn't leave here now after what these people have done for us. No way. The cost of the battalion, 17 killed and 35 wounded. And as you can see, the conditions are somewhat arduous. The, the light is uh, limited. We've only got a small six kilowatt generator outside. It began for us, uh, for, for me personally, with the very badly injured air crewman of the Royal Marine Scout helicopter that had been sent to pick up uh, a Sunray of two para, Colonel H. This air crewman had a cannon shell through his right leg which was barely hanging on and a machine gun bullet, several in fact, through his lower leg on the left side. As I worked on him, I realized that his pilot, who was a personal friend, was obviously dead. He'd lost a lot of blood, and like many of the men from Tupara, who, after being injured, had to spend some time in the field before they could be picked up under the safety of dusk from marauding Pukara by the, the very brave uh, light uh, helicopter pilots. Like the men from Tupara, this Royal Marine was extremely fit, and so was able to survive this acute blood loss, so acute that he had no pulse when he came in, we could barely feel his heartbeat, and yet he was talking. 
we put four pints of blood into him before the pulse uh, was palpable again and a blood pressure was recorded and made him fit for operation. And for the next 48 hours, there were many, many memories like that. Uh, men coming in cold, wet, almost exsanguinated, and yet they had had some kind of resuscitation and some kind of first aid in the field. The bleeding had been stopped, their courage was there, their fitness was there. And it's a point of great pride to all of us that every man survived. The battle for Darwin and Goose Green provided the first clear indication of Argentine fighting qualities. Individually, they could fight hard. It was their will to continue fighting over an extended period which was lacking, a clear indication of a lack of quality in leadership. This was in marked contrast to the leadership shown at all levels in Tupara. It now seemed most unlikely that Argentine troops would venture from their defensive positions, either to attack the British advance on Port Stanley or even to seek to dominate no man's land. The defeat of the Argentine forces at Darwin and Goose Green removed one of Brigadier Thompson's worries. He could not spare men to mask the enemy position there. Every available man would be required for the final battle. The launch pad for that battle, and indeed the vital ground, was the line of dominating hills. In the north, Mount Estancia reached by three para on the 1st of June. In the centre, Mount Kent, initially secured by the SAS, who were then reinforced by 4-2 commando. On the 4th of June, 4-5 commando took over. In the south, Mount Challenger, to where 4-2 commando moved forward. On the 1st of June, Canberra, the great white whale, re-entered San Carlos water. On board were five brigade and headquarters land forces. They had sailed south in QE2, cross-decking into Canberra at South Georgia. Five brigades organization had a distinctly ad hoc look to it. Second Battalion Scots Guards and First Battalion Welsh Guards, both direct from public duties in London, had replaced two and three para, now part of three commando brigade. They joined First Battalion 7th Gurkha Rifles, 4th Field Regiment Royal Artillery, and assorted hastily co-opted logistic units. Five Brigade lacked the Arctic experience, clothing, equipment, and vehicles of three commando brigade. General Moore had arrived ahead of Five Brigade in the frigate HMS Antrim, conferring en route with Admiral Woodward on board his flagship HMS Hermes. It seems to me that, uh, first of all, what we were after uh, was a victory ashore uh, for one of our groups of, of men, battalion or whatever, that was going to prove that our guys could really do it. And my goodness, they have today right. uh, and yesterday. They had that considerable fight yesterday, captured a hundred or so prisoners uh, and took the first part and surrounded the others. And then as a result of proving their quality and their moral domination, frankly, I think that's probably the reason that the others have surrendered today. I arrived in San Carlos on the 30th and Tupara had just the previous day taken Goose Green in that marvellously brave action, which was very important to me because I'd been hoping for an action which would establish in the minds of the enemy that in anything like a battle between equal forces, we were going to win it. And there couldn't be much doubt from now on that we'd established that. The second thing was that, of course, uh, the Yomp Tab was going on across the northern part of the island, and three commando brigade were moving forward. 42 commando had not yet begun to move into Mount Kent, but were just about to. Three Commando Brigade was on its way. Coming along behind, of course, and I'd been in QE2 with them, were Five Brigade, and they were going to be landed, and I wasn't quite clear which way we were going to move with them. Now, the people who were already there had experienced several days of these very heavy air attacks from the Argentinian Air Force. The rest of us hadn't, and uh, whilst there were a lot of alerts, and occasional aircraft came over during the night. The daylight raids on San Carlos had ceased by the time I arrived, 
So I didn't have to suffer those air attacks. And there's no doubt that they coloured the way that people thought about things and rightly coloured the way that uh, people thought about things. And I think that was an important aspect of the amount that we could use various facilities, the amount one was prepared to thrust helicopter movement forward in daylight without cover, and the amount of protection one was going to provide for forces moving forward. The first 7th Gurkhas were the first troops of 5 Brigade to leave the beachhead. They marched south to Goose Green to replace 2 Para, who now also came under command of 5 Brigade. It was at this moment that there came an opportunity for 2 Para to make a dramatic move forward in the direction of Stanley. After the Battle of Goose Green, B Company was the standby company for any further operations. On the 2nd of June, we got intelligence from Brooks Hardcastle, the manager at Darwin, that if we could manage to get to Swan Inlet, which is some 20 k's forward of our positions at Goose Green, we may well be able to ring through to Fitzroy and find out whether there are any enemy in either Fitzroy or uh, Bluff Cove. This slightly harebrained scheme, which was codenamed the 50p telephone call, uh, I managed to convince Chris Keeble that it was worth a try and also to convince the Brigadier that we should give it a go. So at about 1400 hours on the 2nd of June, I took off with three scout helicopters and two armed helicopters to make the assault onto Swan Inlet House. Myself and Colossant Morris approached the house. I threw a brick through the window. He tried the door and found it open. We got inside. We found one jacket from an Argentinian who had been wounded. We searched the house and then found the telephone, an old-fashioned one, which we cranked twice, which is the code for Fitzroy, and we got through to Ron Binney's daughter. I answered the telephone, and they said it was them, so I took off and got back. Uh, what did they say to you? Well, they just said it was the British Army. <laughs> did you say anything to them? <laughs> no, they asked me if the Argent were in, and I said no, and then I went and got back. <laughs> I came in and uh, answered, and they said, yes, the British Army. And, uh, I said, well, that's great, Neil. Where are you? Of course, they wouldn't tell me. They said, we're still at in the Darwin area, but um, I knew they were fairly close because they, they were quite late on the phone. Mm -hmm. So what did they ask you? They asked, uh, was there any Argentines in the area? And uh, I told them that they pulled out the day before after they blew the Fitzroy Bridge. And um, they asked, was there any Bluff Cove? And I said, well, there wasn't. They all pulled back past there. And they said, fine, we'll, we'll be seeing you later. The news that Fitzroy was free of Argentine forces and the fortuitous presence at Goose Green of the one and only Chinook to have survived the loss of Atlantic conveyor enabled A and B companies of Tupara to leap the 30 miles to Fitzroy and Bluff Cove as dusk fell on the 2nd of June. They were joined by the remainder of the battalion the next morning. So there we had the news that uh, Tupara had got all the way forward to Fitzroy and were moving on to Bluff Cove and 5 Brigade were beginning to catch up, as it were, with the position that 3 Commando Brigade had got to in the mountains. Now, this posed problems as well as giving advantages. I'm a great believer in balance in all things military. And whilst this move obviously achieved tactical balance in the sense of positioning on the ground with both brigades forward, it produced considerable logistic imbalance because all my uh, capability logistically to move stuff was needed to support 3 Commando Brigade forward in the mountains without a lot of spare capacity to suddenly support, start supporting 5 Brigade 40 miles further on than they had been. And this posed very considerable problems to my staff and in particular the logistic staff. An important factor which had influenced logistic planning from a very early stage was the Royal Navy's statement that they could only maintain 100% air cover for one month after the initial landing. And clearly we had borne this in mind and expected with the use of helicopters not to face this as a problem. But the loss of Atlantic conveyor coupled with the ravages of trench foot as the men got into the mountains meant that we really had to speed up logistics as quickly as possible to ensure that we brought the Argentinians to a decisive battle before that month was out. And therefore I was faced with a problem with few helicopters with virtually no land transport in getting forward stocks both in the north and the south to establish the four brigade maintenance areas. And eventually we decided the only way we could possibly do this was by using a landing ship's logistic. 
in the north to support three commando brigade, we were able to get into Teal Inlet without enemy interference and establish a very well positioned Ford BMA. The problem remained of how to move forward and then supply the rest of five brigade in the south, thereby positioning both of General Moore's brigades for the final battle for Port Stanley. I was very conscious here of the problem of timing in this concentration of forces. The ships of the task force had been down in the South Atlantic for some time. They'd been suffering the depredations of weather, enemy action and so on. And of course my troops up in the mountains were going to suffer from the oncoming winter. Everything pointed to getting on with the operation and conducting this battle as soon as possible. So we had to get 5 Brigade forward on the right flank. And there were a number of ways this could be done. In the end, we came down with a plan to move them over one night and thus, in a timing sense, minimise the risk of the enemy air finding them and attacking them and so on. Five Brigade had to be moved across the island as quickly as possible. And, as with three Commando Brigade immediately after the landings, there were insufficient helicopters to do the job. General Moore's plan, therefore, involved the bold move of sending HMS Intrepid on a once-only mission to Bluff Cove, using the southern route around Lafonia, with the two guards' battalions on board. This plan, however, gave rise to considerable concern at Northwood. Tactically, the risk might be acceptable. That was a matter for General Moore to decide. But there were wider issues to be considered. In New York, United Nations Secretary General Perez de Cuella was finding increasing support for a ceasefire, even amongst nations which had supported Britain earlier. The Battle of Darwin and Goose Green had bluntly reminded people that war means death and casualties, and this was surely only a small encounter beside the battle for Port Stanley, which must be only a few days away. This was a mood to be echoed by some of our European allies too. At home, the government remained firmly opposed to any ceasefire which left Argentine forces on the Falklands. And in this, it had the overwhelming support of the general public. At Northwood, Admiral Fieldhouse had to balance the tactical and the political risks. If a capital ship were to be lost en route for Bluff Cove, with the two guards battalions on board, such a major and seemingly avoidable catastrophe could undermine public support and so weaken the political will to press home the victory which land forces were now well placed to secure. Admiral Fieldhouse therefore vetoed General Moore's plan and instructed him to submit another, with somewhat less political risk. This was where my Commander-in-Chief rang me up uh, and made the points to me that for reasons which were quite apparent to him back home and to me when he put them to me, we must change the plan. And so we did it a different way. When the General and his staff came to me with their request for me to move the greater part of Fire Brigade around to Bluff Cove by sea, I was quite obviously fairly concerned. Um, there was a major logistic problem, uh, apart from the troop problem, and I had agreed for Tristram to be loaded with ammunition and sailed, and I didn't really want to add to that. However, it needed to be done, and there were good naval arguments for getting on with the, the land battle. So, I put the staff to work to produce a plan and the solution they came up with, which I agreed with, was for the Scots Guards to go in intrepid uh, by night and they would be disembarked into the landing craft uh, by Lively Island in the mouth of Chesil Sound, where intrepid should be safe from Exocet and other forms of attack. So it was that HMS Intrepid made the voyage around the coast of Lafonia on the night of the 5th of June to Lively Island from where the Scots guards embarked in Intrepid's four landing craft for the remainder of their journey to Bluff Cove. In the prevailing weather conditions, they should have only had about a three to four hour sea journey, but the wind shifted and headed them and the journey took seven hours before they were landed in Bluff Cove. We planned the following night to take Fearless and rendezvous with two of the landing craft used the previous night with the Scots guards and land the Welsh Guards in a similar fashion. Unfortunately, the weather at um, Bluff Cove was such that the two landing craft didn't think it was safe to sail. And so we had to launch 
the two we carried with us, and that only um, gave us space for two companies. And so at the end of that night, we were left with the Welsh Guard split in half and had to think again. The need to get the remainder of the Welsh Guards into position on the right flank was now extremely urgent, but to move them in an assault ship on a third successive night was ruled out as an unacceptable risk. And then we discovered that the field ambulance had not managed to get on board to Tristram and get round to uh, Fitzroy as planned, and that they still had to get they got round. So the brigade, the general staff, again came to me and said, "Please, how are you going to get them round?" And I argued strongly to say we must get them by helicopter or some other means. But it was quite clear that if the land battle was going to take place, they would need the field ambulance, and they would need the Welsh Guards as well. And so I selected the one empty LSL, Sir Galahad, who was lying in St Carlos, just unloaded, and loaded her and ordered her around. And she arrived and started her offload on the day of the attack. The risk was real enough, as events of the 8th of June showed. The 5,700 ton LSL, Sir Galahad, tasked to complete the job the assault ships had begun, lay bombed and ablaze in Port Pleasant. The Welsh Guards, along with men of the field ambulance, engineers and several other units, were still on board when she was attacked. 43 soldiers died and 108 were injured. Five men of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary also lost their lives and 11 others were injured. The companies of the Welsh Guards on board Sir Galahad expected to go direct to Bluff Cove to join the rest of the battalion. But Sir Galahad was ordered to Fitzroy, where five brigade needed their field ambulance. This was unwelcome news to the Welsh Guards because withdrawing Argentine troops had partially blown the only bridge linking the two settlements. When the ship anchored off Fitzroy in Port Pleasant around dawn on the 8th of June, there was a delay in disembarkation. Nearby, Sir Galahad's sister ship, Sir Tristram, also at anchor, having sailed round 24 hours earlier, was busy unloading ammunition. There was a shortage of landing craft, and those available were heavily committed. It was decided to offload the field ambulance before the Welsh Guards. Meanwhile, all this activity in Port Pleasant had been observed on Stanley radar, and the two little ships at anchor in broad daylight, with as yet no organised air defence, were just too tempting a target for the Argentine Air Force. During this campaign, we depended very heavily on the light helicopters evacuating casualties from the front line and the medium and support helicopters lifting and shifting our customers back to Uganda. They were tremendous. They were very busy on the night of June the 8th. You saw them, obviously, in the shots back here, rescuing casualties from the smoking wreck of Galahad and Tristram. All those casualties arrived that night at Ajax Bay, helicopter load after helicopter load. And in the confusion of that night, my memory is of 70 of those 150 Welsh guards being told by me that because they only had 10% burns, they could not be treated at Ajax Bay. They took the news with great courage and stoicism, standing there, blowing on their hands with tattered remnants of skin hanging from their burnt fingers. Each man seemed to know somebody else more badly injured than him inside. They took that decision and the further journey with great courage, and I think it should be recorded. Tragic though it was, the injury and loss of life at Fitzroy could not be allowed to delay preparations for the final battle. The two companies of the Welsh Guards who had been on Sir Galahad had lost all their weapons and equipment. They were airlifted back to San Carlos and replaced by two companies of 40 commandos who were still holding the San Carlos beachhead. The 1st 7th Gurkha rifles also moved up by air and sea from Goose Green. Getting on with the battle was now of paramount importance because the fighting ability of the men of 3 Commando Brigade 
living now for more than a week under extremely unpleasant conditions in the hills of Mounts Kent, Challenger and Estancia, was bound to deteriorate increasingly with every day that passed. Ahead of them, beyond Mount Kent, lay a staircase of well-defended features with Port Stanley at its foot. Two Sisters and Goat Ridge, with Mount Tumbledown beyond, Mount William and Mount Harriet to the south, and visible beyond Tumbledown, the ships anchored in Port Stanley Harbour. So here we were, ten days into June, our troops established in the mountains, getting their reconnaissance done, five brigade forward, we were ready for the final battle to come. 